Welcome, um, everybody, back here on HowlRound to our fourth week of Siegel Talks um, here at the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY um, in New York City. As far as we know, it's the only theater institution in the United States that does daily new created programming, not going back to archives, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but we truly really think it's a time where we have to think and listen and be in contact and uh, also perhaps understand a little better that new world, that globally connected world that is so close to us, so small the world has gotten. But on the other hand, our private lives also have gotten so small and and uh, sometimes even claustrophobic, we can really go out. And we heard from uh, around the world, from Hong Kong, from uh, uh, Italy, from uh, Burkina Faso, from uh, Belgium, Switzerland, Germany, uh, Italy, as I already said, and India, Pakistan. And um, we had very, very significant, uh, I think, uh, uh, things to listen to from artists. Um, artists uh, are the one who are on the right side of social justice, on the right side of the progress of history, and their evaluations over centuries have been the right ones most of the time. And I think uh, the current crisis we live on um, in the tragic time, as Mila Rao said, we hear our Richard Schechner yesterday says, actually, it's a farcical time. I wish we had leaders like in the great tragedies. Um, 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 the times we live in, we need to hear uh, voices from leaders in our field. And uh, today we have a, a great honor to have a, a master of uh, theater and performance uh, with us in an art form I highly appreciate and so many others. Um, who has dedicated his uh, work and energy towards the world with puppets and um, objects, moving objects uh, on stage. He's a grandmaster on that field, uh, the great Basil Jones from the Handspring Company in South Africa in Cape Town. And um, not only you might know him from the work on War Horse, uh, but also his, his great work, Ubu in the Truth Commission, the Wojciech that it, and many, many other things. Uh, working on traditions of puppet theater in Africa and Ghana that comes from but working with Kendridge and contemporary uh, dramaturgy and European and American theater. They created something I think is unique. And uh, we had Basil with us at the Siegel Center and I still remember uh, his talks and what he said, so I can't wait to hear what he has to say. So it's time for me to shut up uh, and actually say uh, hi to Basil. Hi, Frank, and and uh, I'm really honoured to be one of your guests on this on this show. It's a fantastic um, thing that you're doing, and uh, I'm going to be enjoying watching it as you go forward with all uh, your really really interesting uh, guests. So yeah, lovely to be with you. Thank you, uh, Basil. And um, we, where are you now, and <clears throat> what time is it? Um, it's uh, 6 p.m. in Cape Town. Um, I live uh, in Cork Bay, which is about half an hour drive from the center of Cape Town. It's a little fishing village. Um, it's a pretty special place in that it was one of the few places where uh, apartheid kind of failed in, in the apartheid period in South Africa. Uh, we have a fishing community here and uh, they tried to relocate them um, during the apartheid period and failed because really fishermen go out at four o'clock in the morning. Um, if they had to travel two hours to get here, they'd have to get up at two o'clock in the morning. So it was really ridiculous to, uh, to more than ridiculous to uh, relocate um, the, the local fishing population. So they stayed and so um, unlike many, many other towns around South Africa, we don't have um, the kind of uh, separation um, that's, that, that is a spatial separation uh, a legacy of apartheid, which happens everywhere else in South, well, not everywhere else, but in many other places in South Africa, um, uh, black and white or colored and white are separated because of the apartheid period and haven't yet reintegrated. Not to say that this is a completely re-integrated uh, 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 village, but um, it is true to say that that many of the people who have been here uh, for five or six generations are still around, and that's a really special part of of why we live here. That sounds like truly a unique place, uh, and most probably you say bay close to the ocean. Um, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So um, how is it? How, how is the mood in, the, <clears throat> in your fishing village, but also on Cape Town from your friends? What's going on in South Africa? Um, well, it's very quiet. Um, we started lockdown early. Um, we've been very successful with lockdown, actually. Uh, um, uh, we don't have many. Uh, we don't have many cases. We don't have many deaths. Um, I think the last I heard, we had had about 50 deaths in the in the whole country. Uh, obviously, that's got to do with testing as well. Um, but generally, we really locked on early. Uh, Ramaphosa, our president, has been very presidential. Um, shown some really good leadership. Um, and our health minister, Zueli Mkhize, has also been really, really good. So um, we've, we're giving the, the hospitals a time to acclimatize to uh, emergency and, um, and get used to the whole treatment regime. Um, but um, what is difficult is that um, if you're in a township, you quite often living four in a room, maybe even six in a room. Um, it's really hard to practice social distancing. And a lot of people, many thousands of people in South Africa rely on going out every day to work uh, and to earn a living. Uh, just uh, what we call spaza shop owners, people who, who sell uh, vegetables or cigarettes or uh, whatever. Uh, all that all that is closed down. The only thing that's open at the moment is uh, pharmacies and supermarkets. Um, and you're not allowed to go to a supermarket that's um, further than the closest one to you. Um, so and and then really, really major, which is unusual, I think I haven't heard it happening anywhere else in the world. Um, all our all our liquor outlets and our cigarette outlets are closed. So um, hmm. for three weeks now, it's not been possible to buy any alcohol or any cigarettes. So even if um, you go to a supermarket, um, you cannot buy cigarettes. There's no outlets for that. And it's obviously because of um, uh, things like domestic violence in, in small, you know, if everyone's living together, um, and and people are drinking too much it can be really really dangerous um we've got a lot of um uh, spousal abuse in south africa unfortunately uh, and also obviously cigarettes and smoking um not a good thing when you've got a major um lung uh, lung disease on the go uh, but it's really hard for for everyone and for adrian and i um it was we decided that we needed to be really healthy if we were going to get sick so best not to have any alcohol so we mm -hmm. stopped um uh drinking for the first week of the lockdown and then decided actually that's rather hard and so um uh, and but we hadn't stocked up um and uh, the result is that we have um, four bottles of wine left um, for the rest of the lockdown, which is probably at the earliest uh, uh, stop at the beginning of May. So um, that's, that's a bit tough. But we've, we, we, the, the main problem that we have is feeding, feeding people who, who have run out of money. Um, and last night, uh, President Ramaphosa announced a massive uh, 500 billion rand um, um, program to uh, do food packages to support the unemployment insurance um, uh, program um, and many, many other things <clears throat> to try to uh, grapple with the problem of, of feeding our country. Um, but the bottom line is we started early and we feel at the moment that um, the president uh, is leading us uh, pretty well. That's such a contrast to, if I remember right, to the AIDS crisis <clears throat> where South Africa for a while um, was known for okay. ignoring or openly denying. Yeah. Is that a result yeah, out of that? We are, we are so grateful that uh, Zuma is no longer uh, uh, president of the country and Ramaphosa 
<clears throat> he was um, he was a, a a billionaire business person um, before he became president. He was kind of originally the person earmarked by Nelson Mandela to take over from him, I think, mm -hmm. uh, but that didn't happen. Um, but he's, you know, he's run big businesses and uh, that's a fairly useful thing, I think, for running countries. Um, and uh, he's very, he's very measured. Um, we, you know, he's got a massive task on his hands, uh, but so far he's doing, he's doing extremely well. Well, these are truly encouraging news um, to hear compared to many also devastating reports we hear from India, uh, Pakistan, yeah. uh, from uh, America, especially a country and one would expect to hear the good news you are just reporting. It seems to be uh, we live in opposite world uh, at the moment mm -hmm. for so many uh, of us. And um, Richard uh, Schechner yesterday did say uh, at the moment, it sounds like, and he quoted a friend, there's a nuclear fusion in a reactor the roof is blown open and we all watch with uh, on live on the internet before we might not have known fully about outbreaks, but now everything is so connected and we, we look a, a bit with horror and sorrow. Um, in it. Um, your work um, um, in theater as part of a social justice, justice has been um, significant uh, in, in South Africa. You have seen your country change. Um, mm. Do you feel uh, the moment is uh, some kind of a watermark too? Is something changing in the country again? Um, you know, it's it's hard to see beyond now. Um, we 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 kind of living in the new abnormal. Um, it's it's uh, I I'm actually I kind of uh, I I I have been saying to Adrian. Um, that uh, Adrian's my partner since 1971. We've been together for 49 years, um, worked together. Congratulations, um, great. And, uh, and live together. So we've had a lot of lockdown in our lives and we're very, very happy with it. Um, uh, I, I've been saying to Adrian that in terms of the ecological crisis in, in the world, and today is a world... Earth Day. Day yeah. Um, um, in terms of the ecological crisis, we we need something absolutely catastrophic um, in order to accept uh, that we need to change radically, um, and and only something absolutely catastrophic will will create that change. And I think that the the coronavirus catastrophe is that catastrophe um, and I think that we're gonna we're gonna come out of this um, really ready to uh, to make the massive ecological changes that uh, we have to make in the in the world uh, I think that um, um, we we We've, we're seeing how animals are beginning to come out um, in in cities. Um, how how you know the canals of Venice clarified, and suddenly there are fish uh, swimming in the canals of Venice. We we kind of seeing very encouragingly how how quickly uh, things can change and and revert to what they used to be. Um, we loving the the silence. One of the things that is fantastic about the lockdown is silence. So, from our house uh, uh, above Cork Bay, for the first time we can hear the waves breaking, which we can't hear when there's traffic going by. Um, we can also smell the the air uh, coming from the sea um, as sort of beautiful fresh air, which we don't uh, normally smell again because of. Of traffic, it's not serious, but it's so it's bad enough to actually for us not to smell the sea, even though we're really close to the sea. So I I'm very optimistic that we we we've, we've kind of really seen what uh, what um, we we've come together with a crisis that this is a completely global crisis, um, and we're going to come out of it um, in a in a much more Comrade, we're going to come out of it as comrades, uh, global comrades, um, and to me, that's that's very exciting. I think uh, I think we'll be impoverished um, for sure. Um, it's 
the crisis has humbled us um, because for the first time, uh, middle-class people um, can't predict a future ahead. Um, no one really knows what's, uh, what's gonna happen next. And that, that puts us on the same level as, as people who don't have work. That puts us on the same level as people who don't have houses. Uh, that puts us on the same level as old people who don't have uh, medical insurance. It, it humbles us and uh, it, all of us could, could die. Um, we're all in the same boat. And I think that um, coming, coming out of this, what, what's really going to, we, what we're really going to focus on is uh, the environment and what we've been doing to the environment and a, a desperate need to, um, to make changes. We, uh, I'll just give you one example. Um, we were in Shanghai, we were in China for Warhorse um, some years ago. And we took a, 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 that sort of bullet train from Shanghai to Beijing. It's uh, 1,500 kilometers. Um, I'm not sure what that is in, in uh, miles, but- 1,200 um, miles or something like that. Mm -hmm. 1,200 miles. Or 1,000 um, miles we, maybe, yeah. We, as we sped um, from uh, through the landscape, from through villages, past villages, through towns, through cities, um, I can't remember how long it took, but I think it was about five hours. Um, we never left heavy pollution through all parts of, of that 1500 kilometers. We were in pollution right throughout. Um, I mean, very tangible pollution. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really what we, what we dealing with. And, um, I believe that coming through this, we'll 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 be ready to tackle it, um, and and the, uh, I think that the people, the voters, are going to be insisting that their governments tackle it. Mm -hmm. Well, then, the South Africa, in a way, has been such a remarkable example of things that can change. And I think Angela Merkel uh, in Germany, who says, you know, things do change, or El Gore with his initiative, he said, I have seen things change, so don't. Just look at the moment, look ahead, but be part of the change, do something for it. What role did, did your work play uh, it, it, in the apartheid and the change? Did, this, did you work theatrically involved? What did you do? <clears throat> and what contribution did your, your specific theater, and tell us a little bit about it, what did it make? Um, we, we, uh, we, um, we were very engaged. Uh, we, uh, we, we, um, when Adrian and I left the country um, in the uh, late seventies, we, um, we, we were trying to escape the army. We had both been in the army and in non-combative roles, um, and we, of course, we hated. It, it was, they were very clever. Uh, the South African government was very clever because they would come to your high school um, and uh, the high school would give the army all the addresses of all the, all the boys. And then you would get a, um, a they, they would have your address and you would then get a letter uh, calling you up to the army as you came to your matric to the end of your school period. It was very, very difficult to avoid. There was, in those days, there was no organization of uh, uh, anti-conscription campaign uh, that came later, but there wasn't any such thing then. So one kind of, um, it, it, you couldn't get away from it. Um, and we both did basic training in the army and, and I won't go through all the details, but eventually we, uh, we left the country and we, uh, we went to Botswana, which was, uh, which is right next door to South Africa. And we both got jobs there. And while we were there, uh, we became involved with the ANC's cultural group, the uh, um, ANC cultural group. Um, and, um, and it was quite interesting for us because we were two fairly out gay guys um, with a lot of really angry uh, political guys who just come over from, th this was 1978, 79 and 80. 
1976, the school uprisings uh, had just happened and a lot of people from those uprisings had gone to Botswana. Um, the art, all the arts people were there. Um, and um, it was a real learning curve for us. Um, we, we, you know, because of apartheid, we didn't really know very many black South Africans. Um, and to be in an African country uh, where uh, we were uh, foreigners and uh, in, a, in, a, in a political group where we were uh, from the whites um, in the ANC, it, it, was, it was difficult and, and very, very challenging for us because we were, um, we were very naive politically. Um, but during those three years, we certainly, uh, we certainly learned a lot about politics. And uh, so when we been, went back to South Africa, um, we, were, um, we were kind of different people. Um, However, in the first five years of the country, we had to, of, of, of our puppet company, which we started in 1981, um, we were uh, doing children's shows and touring to schools. Um, and you can't be very political, which we were thinking po politically, but we, we couldn't, um, most of our children's shows would have some kind of nasty oppressor and uh, people rebelling against the oppressor, um, but they were they were lighthearted. They were musicals in a way, and we toured them to schools around South Africa and to Botswana, Namibia, uh, Swaziland. Um, uh, but in 1985, um, President Boerta uh, announced um, the emergency. And at that time, you couldn't go from then onwards, we weren't allowed into schools during school time. Um, and uh, that meant that we had to find a different way of earning a living. Um, they said you can go to school after, uh, you can perform at schools after school, but not during school. But after school, uh, the learners all leave school and go to sport or extra lessons or ballet or whatever. It, it was not, um, we would never have got an audience after school, unfortunately. Um, so we moved from Cape Town then to Johannesburg and uh, we got involved in children's television, uh, which we did not love, but had no other option at that time. But during that period, we became involved with the, um, uh, with the Junction Avenue Theatre Company and William Kentridge was part of that company. Um, and we started to, the Market Theatre at that time, which was the uh, second non-racial theatre company in South Africa, um, became, um, uh, it, it, it became a really, important uh, focus for a lot of political thinking, a lot of po political expression. And at that time in 1985, uh, during the year of our move, we also did a very uh, important for us play called Episodes of an Easter Rising. It was our first adult play. We were very scared of doing an adult play because we knew we'd have no audience for puppets for adults. Um, and this play was a play about two women um, on, a, on an isolated farm in the Eastern Transvaal who are visited by an activist uh, who arrives on the farm unannounced. Um, they give him water um, and he chats with them and then he leaves and then he comes back some days later wounded and they are uh, badly wounded and they take him in and uh, while he's um, kind of in their spare room, in their guest room, the police arrive and say that they're looking for this man. Um, and they don't mention anything about the man. Um, and I won't go into the rest of the play, but what, what struck us about it, it was actually a radio play that we turned into a, um, a puppet play. What we loved about it, Adrian and I, um, was the fact that um, the two women, you, the audience gradually becomes aware of the fact that the two women are lovers um, and that their, their political um, 
their politics comes out of uh, the, their macro politics comes out of the sexual politics of their lives. They had been ostracized from town because of their relationship. That's why they were living on an isolated farm, and um, and it kind of spoke to to Adrian and I, these two lesbian women. Uh, it, their politics, we we kind of understood very much because we were in the same boat. Um, so um, that was that was the first piece we did, and it it was different from a lot of the theatre that was happening at the time, in that there was a lot of protest theatre then, um, uh, very um, strident uh, work, and. Uh, somewhat accusatory to the white audiences that it was playing to mainly. And our piece was very, um, uh, it was very political, but in a very muted way. Um, when we took this work to, the, the work by the way, did really, really well. Um, first at the Market Theatre and then at the National Arts Festival in Grahamstown, where it was such a hit that people, uh, who couldn't get tickets sat in the corridor outside the theater just listening to the dialogue. Um, and when, when we took it to, uh, friends of ours helped us um, uh, take the show to France to um, an international theater festival there, uh, a puppet theater festival. And when we played it, we had only one performance because they felt we were um, being a South African show um, there was a cultural boycott at that time. And in fact, we were part of the ANC cultural group, should have been supporting the cultural boycott, but we didn't actually believe in the cultural boycott for, for left-wing uh, people. We didn't believe in isolating uh, the left internationally. I think we, we have lost, uh, Basil, can you hear me? Um, Get well, I say, before. Basil, we just, um, can you hear me, uh, yeah. Basil? I think we yep. just lost you. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, but just uh, after you said that you were only had one uh, spot, that also the video is a bit, <clears throat> uh, 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 stops once in a while, but maybe one in the moment you try to reconnect or, or something, but I think we can hear you. So it's, say again, yeah. so you, you were, um, that you only uh, had one uh, spot. Um, we, we did one, one performance, um, but um, people said, well, obviously you can't go back to South Africa with a play like this. And we said, but we've already performed it in South Africa. And part of the strangeness of uh, that period was some people involved in theater doing political work were persecuted quite badly and others weren't. Um, and we were fortunate in that we were not um, not really uh, persecuted uh, by the government. And then after that piece, we, we did a number of pieces. All of them were not stridently political, but were, were political nevertheless. So it was slightly, um, I don't know how to describe it really. We, 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 we tried to be really nuanced and not to, um, we didn't want uh, to, um, come to the, our audience with an answer. Uh, we wanted the audience to walk away in argument rather than um, than knowing what we were. Yeah. So that was that was that, and and that was a, a long period. And then when we came to the end of um, when when democracy came to South Africa. We had a big problem. All theatre had a big problem because we didn't really know what to make plays about any longer. Um, and um, and <clears throat> and we uh, and also we were involved. We had been involved very much with William Kentridge. We'd had ten amazing years doing uh, first uh, Wojciech on Highfield, then uh, Fastest in Africa, Ubu and the Truth Commission. Uh, we did an opera with him, um, uh, um, Zeno at 4 a.m. Um, and, uh, and, and another opera, uh, The Return of Ulysses, based on a Monteverdi work. Um, we had a fantastic time, very um, good for us. We were at all the big festivals in Europe. Um, and 
but we began, began to, I think unconsciously, uh, the, our excuse for moving from Johannesburg to Cape Town was that we were always touring abroad. And whenever we came back to Johannesburg, we came back to this really ugly, dangerous, urban city and not to the beautiful landscape that we knew of in South Africa. And so we said we wanted to go back to, South, to Cape Town, which is where I was born, um, and, and to the landscape and to the seascape of the Cape. But I think subconsciously what was also happening was we, we, were, um, we were becoming less collaborators and more servitors of, of William's great genius. Um, in the beginning, when he... Um, when he was quite uncertain about theatre, um, he was more collaborative um, with us than, mm. than as time went on, he became more and more um, in control of what he wanted to do. And, um, and I think that we, we felt we were serving his vision. Um, that's a slightly... Um, unfortunate way of putting it but we love to work together and and still we are extremely good friends but we felt we needed to um, find our own vision um, and so the first piece we did when we moved to Cape Town was um, a piece about a chimpanzee um, that um, had been brought up in America and uh, uh, was a tamed chimpanzee and um, who had come originally from Africa, uh, owned obviously by, by a woman who um, uh, took him to performing commercials and various other things. And as happens with chimpanzees, when they become adolescent, um, they become very um, uncontrollable and sexually demanding. Um, and the decision was made to bring this chimpanzee back to, to Africa to rewild it. Um, and um, uh, the play begins with the arrival of the chimpanzee in um, a, a, a chimpanzee preserve in, um, uh, in, in Africa um, and in Tanzania. Uh, and the whole play happens in this, uh, this reserve. It was, it was a play that was centered on an animal. Um, and this animal actually was a, a sign, an animal who had been taught human sign language. Um, so we had a signing chimpanzee, which was quite a big challenge for Adrian to make. Um, and after that, we did another play um, about a giraffe. Um, and then after that, we did another play about horses. Um, and now we've got plays about um, elephants and um, wolves in the pipeline. And we kind of realized that, that without really knowing what we were doing, uh, we were making theater where an animal, uh, as an animal, was in the center of a piece of theater. Um, and, and we realized looking around that no one else had ever done that before. Um, we realized that puppetry is actually the ideal medium for doing that because you can't, you can't really perform an animal as, as people, although obviously that does happen. But generally in, in theater, what's happened at the moment uh, up to now is that animals do appear in theater, but never in the center of the piece of theater. The chimp in, in, uh, in the chimp piece, uh, which was called the chimp project, uh, the chimpanzee was the central character, um, and in uh, uh, in the tall horse, which was the next project we did with a with a giraffe, the giraffe uh, was the central character. It was was given um, by the Pasha of Egypt to the King of France in 1827 um, as a bribe to try to get France to not interfere with um, the. Um, the attack on Greece, but because Greece was a Christian country, France uh, didn't go along with that. But the, uh, the giraffe was used as, as the bribe and as the center of this piece. And um, 
so what began happening was we 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 kind of realized that what we could do was was bring animals back into the theatrical canon um, or bring animals into the the theatrical canon that had um, never had animals as central um, and that that was an entirely um, appropriate thing to be doing in in this time in our time where we are in such danger of uh, eradicating so many animals um, so mm -hmm. it, it seems to be the right kind of theater to be making and if our theater has any politics uh, it's it's a kind of an animal politics um, where um, reflecting on on what we're looking at today we would maybe provocatively be saying well the real virus uh on this planet is humanity um and humanity's insistence that they are at the top of a pyramid um uh and and we're kind of sort of saying um that we need to think of animals as part of who we are and part of um, uh, our theatrical lives. Um, so that's kind of um, that's kind of an important part of of what yeah. we're doing and how we see ourselves. Yeah, I do remember, um, if I remember right, your slight disappointment that the war horse story actually did not look like in the original novel through the eyes of the horse at the war, but then once again through a little boy who grows up. And but that what for you was important to have that um, on your mind. In the time yeah. of Corona, in the time we live now, the uncertainty, um, um, artists sitting like you in their uh, home producing or not producing, uh, you said maybe you share us a little bit uh, later on with my your workshop, which would be fascinating to see. Mm. Um, from what you learned in your experience of as a master in your field, um, is there something in what you found that you feel that can work and will work to change uh, or contribute to the change we all want to see that we have to be part of. Edouard Glissant, the great writer who actually was teaching also at the Grand Center Cunha, he said so much is a failure of imagination, the fear of the foreigner, the fear of that maybe you not having a Mercedes uh, will make you a not successful person. In Germany, it's slowly changing. The young people say, we don't really need that. I have a bike or whatever, but it's a real, the imagination that we have to change. Is there something in your work where you say to fellow artists and young artists in the time of Corona afterwards, where we have to find new ways to tell stories and to have to acknowledge, is there something we say, think about this. This is something we found that might have an answer and already what you said, you know, focusing on the animal or puppets instead of actors or part of it. Um, is there something where you say, please, l please listen to that from our experience in South Africa? Um, I, I, I think it's too early to answer that question. Um, already, we are we are engaged in something that is um, that is very um, new theatrically uh, and not about animals, um, which is uh, the walk um, and and migrancy. Um, you know, you mentioned Al Gore um, a few minutes ago, and Al Gore is a person who who says that um, in ten years' time there will be a billion people on the march, and the reason why is that we are destroying our places where we can grow things. Um, people are, are are can't grow crops, and so they have to move away from. Um, uh, places where there's no water, and that's a very serious problem here in South Africa, by the way. Um, we've got serious droughts um, in many of our towns where the water, the groundwater is gone. Um, and uh, those people are all going to be move, moving, um, moving to other places. They're going to be um, ecological migrants rather than war migrants. Um, so uh, one of the projects that we are involved in um, is uh, a giant of a little migrant girl um, who is um, uh, three, three and a half meters tall, um, um, who will be walking across Europe 
um, next year um, from, from Turkey um, through Greece and um, Germany and, and France. Um, visiting places that are friendly to to migrants um, and this is a it's it's suddenly uh, become really problematic because migrancy is going to be even more difficult um, in the time after corona um, but it's not going to go away unfortunately um, so we are we are um, the, the the company that is is behind this called good chance who did that wonderful um, piece of theatre that started in the um, in in Calais, uh, but also played in London and has sun, si since um, gone uh, called the Jungle, uh, yeah. gone to New York and and yeah, elsewhere. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, good a good chance is the name of the company, and um, and uh, they they are at the moment visiting many sites throughout Europe where where migrants are or migrants are welcome or will be welcomed. Um, and uh, we are seeing how how this will work with uh, the arrival of a giant um, little little girl migrant. Um, um, they, they are finding ways to welcome her um and um and seeing what what she might do we've done quite a few workshops uh, we've been making these giant puppets here in in south africa and um and that's that's a project for for the future for us but how we as south africans will will come out of this i i, I don't know at the moment i think um we we we'll, I, I, I'm pretty sure that's what's going to come out immediately after um, the the lockdown ends and we become slightly more normal. Uh, they're probably going to be um, humorous um, stories of of people uh, living through lockdown, um, satirical uh, stories of of the lockdown experience. And then after that, when people can bear it. Um, there'll be there'll be probably tragedies um, of uh, theatrical tragedies about the of the coronavirus period, and way beyond that, I you know I I don't know. I think we've still got to get through those two uh, mm -hmm. theatrical periods before um, we start to look beyond it. It's you know it's a little bit like um, South Africa during the apartheid period. At that time, all we could think of was um, getting rid of apartheid, and we did that through uh, Peter Dirk Ace, for instance, was the great satirist. Um, he did fantastic satires of the apartheid period, um, and then there were other people uh, who did um, uh, tragedies of um, uh, that that apartheid had created. So I think theatrically, we we're going to go through those two. Um, uh, those two periods before we can start thinking beyond that. And I think that uh, I predict that that beyond that we'll be thinking about the environment and and making plays about um, the global um, uh, the global environment and and how we come to terms with with stopping um, anything like uh, coronavirus happening again, although mm -hmm. of course we can't. But it's interesting you know, that uh, that serious work, uh, it, all work, of course, is serious with puppets, whether it's, you know, the Caragas play or uh, Punch and Judy or Italian uh, uh, puppet plays or marionettes, but uh, the serious work which you pioneered that came out of uh, uh, South Union and Apartheid, where perhaps looking at an animated piece let's, of material, of wood, where it's not really yeah. a woman, not a man, it's, it doesn't have a religion, so people, it created an opening in the mind for people and it's something um, that I think is a something for everybody to think about in that new form of, uh, of, of theater we are looking for that this is something that is also in a way good way a popular theater a theater that uh, um, and appeals to 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 the people and as we say entertains the drunk but looks back and uh, at the moment where we are in and, and forward so I think you really um, found something um, 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 series there that we all should uh, look at in even more as a way of integrating what often people think at the margins, which is not really is. 
I think, Frank, you know, one of the things that uh, is true to say also about Handspring, we we are a, a company that we're ending the, uh, we're coming to the end of our, our kind of theatrical careers. Um, and we, we're very happy that, uh, that there are other people that have come out from us that are now uh, taking the stage, so to speak. And here in South Africa, uh, there's a company called Ukwanda, um, puppetry and design collective. Um, they, they started making uh, theater puppetry during the time when two of them were working at Handspring um, in, the, in the big uh, horse project, making, making horse puppets and, and quietly on their own uh, to um, give um, kids something to do in the evenings. Um, they started making puppets and, and dance and sort of pageants with puppets. And they have subsequently formed a company um, and they are starting to produce plays. So they, um, they, um, they wrote a play, um, Luyanda, who, uh, whose son was very, very ill. He used to go and visit his son in hospital every weekend and sit with him for hours and hours. And he, during that time, wrote uh, a play called Gawe, um, which they did as a company of four and took it to the National Arts Festival, got a, got a, a civil ov silver ovation award there with, for their first play. They've now done another play um, and they are currently doing a, a, a coronavirus uh, sort of series uh, in, their, in lockdown in their in their apartment, uh, or not apartment, in their house. Um, and um, uh, so they are, you know, they, in fact, they were in Germany when um, this whole um, coronavirus thing uh, struck. They were uh, about to start rehearsing a play about water in, in Germany, in Augsburg. Um, you probably know Augsburg is sure. very famous as a, as a as an ancient place of of invention with yep. when it comes to water reticulation um and canal. birthplace of brecht oh really i didn't know yep. that mm -hmm. um so they were in augsburg when this all happened and they had to come back from augsburg go into quarantine and in quarantine and now in lockdown um, they've been 38 days in in lockdown um this this company uh, living in, in a house that we bought for them after a tragedy that happened. One of their company was murdered in the townships. Um, so um, they're doing stuff. And um, there, there are lots of, of upcoming uh, puppet companies, not only in South Africa, but abroad, that are, that are carrying on from where uh, we, in a way, we haven't left off yet. We've got uh, four... Uh, quite big productions still upcoming before we um, say sayonara, mm -hmm. but um, we're we're kind of I think um, we're hoping that that um, that the new young puppet companies um, uh, come up with with stuff that we couldn't do because I'm sure a lot of it will involve um, new technologies and new ways of making theatre um, yeah. that. Um, that are, are kind of a little bit beyond us as we uh, hit uh, 70 years of age next year. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, of course, have all our respect of, of your political work, your theater work, but also the aesthetics. I mean, Warhols only became such a big hit and in London, the National Theater, and then ultimately in New York and you, the Tony Award, you get in all of it because of that exceptional uh, uh, work you, you contributed. Um, can you show us a little bit around uh, uh, what, what, how your uh, inner exile uh, uh, looks like? And, uh, and yeah, um, sure. you know, we well, heard from your colleague, Anarupa Roy in India, I think I mentioned it to you, you know, who said she looked out of her window and saw 500,000 people uh, on the street, a biblical exodus with their children on their back and their belongings, trying to the servants, the poor people who wouldn't be allowed back in their homes, they served so peacefully. Yeah, um, uh, uh, some prepared for a thousand uh, kilometers of, my, of, of marches and they came back. She's taking care of a village of 1800 families of artists, many of them puppeteers 
meanwhile as south africa in a way is a is a model of that things can and will change and uh, so it is just uh, incredible to see all the differences yeah. and uh, we would love to see and maybe it might also for our viewers wonderful to see your space meredith monk who did such a lovely uh, a session with us said say frank i want to see where those people live what's going on i'm going to show my apartment so um so we are following meredith's uh, sure. suggestion and uh well, i hope I, the internet I, will be stable when um when i spoke to you a little bit earlier um yeah. it was uh it was light outside and now it's dark um but these are uh these these are four puppets from a midsummer night's dream that we did at the bristol old vic um and what i'm doing with them is um they're kind of um running around our our house and our studio um doing various things every day i do it's a kind of a stop stop frame animation um thing that i'm doing one one or two or three or four images a day they they are themselves uh, stop frame puppets so they can um whatever you do with them they will just uh, stay in place um and um they i'm having a bit of fun with them nothing serious just um playing around with them so this mm -hmm. is this is my offer the, those are two of the of the warhorse heads that have just ended up here um and um and then down below is adrian's um Adrian studio this is um, one of the places where we work we also have a factory elsewhere um but this is where we, we where we started out working and um this is hello to frank hello frank hey adrian um uh, we don't play for time uh we can't fully hear you um uh we're doing a play um uh based on jm kutsi's life and times of michael cage uh, yeah. kutsi is a nobel prize winning um writer from south africa mm -hmm. um and this is a um a puppet version uh, michael k uh, was um is, is the main character uh he was born with a hair lip Yeah, we we lost them. If you can hear me, I think this is the goat. Uh, this is the goat um, uh, that is very much part of part of the um, the play. Beautiful. Um, and this is. Um, and and his mother yeah he has a teenager yeah and um this is uh, an image of the person that we um uh, we believe michael k was uh who was the first um uh, farm murderer um in south africa i don't know if could see would would agree um this is a drawing a design adrian is doing for he has a baby yeah k as a as a as a child this is michael k as an 8 year old um and uh and, and this is uh, this is michael's mother um <clears throat> so um this is this is where we work um and adrian adrian is uh uh is our um designer and maker of all uh that is a that is a just a, a, a amazing in instead of producing cars and uh and uh computers you create a, a object that really produce imagination and 
are part um, of a change or manifest symbolically um, um, change um, we, we all um, want to see. And uh, can you hear me still, Basil? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah you can. And, um, and it's interesting um, that Meredith Monk showed us her room. She sleeps in her rehearsal room. You live uh, where you create your work. So like artists, you know, are so close that life and art is actually connected that you do home cooking. Richard said yesterday, you know, I started out cooking in Provincetown and then I said my company is just home cooking. I'm back to cooking also now, but in a way that what many artists mention, we will maybe go back to living rooms. We will show the world where we are in this is our world and then share it. And uh, so it's kind of a kind of a return to um, to um, origins, perhaps when you guys uh, started out and uh, Botswana um, in, in the work. What is, um, and we always uh, do say that, what are you reading at the moment? Are you listening to music? Is there something that is inspiring for you in this time, something you rediscovered? Um, well, I'm reading, I'm, I'm reading a John Cotsey novel, um, uh, the, um, the life of the earlier life of Jesus, um, which is, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a strange thing because it's not really about uh, Christ at all. It's, a, it's about a, a young child. And I think the, the thesis of the novel in a way um, is uh, that that all children are are a little um, are, are completely unspoilt and brilliant and um, almost Jesus-like, um, and that there is a Satan around us always. Um, it's it's a it's a uh, an unusually redemptive um, uh, novel with um, with with a reasonably good narrative. Um, it's not as dry as much of of Kutsi's work, um, and I'm in, I'm enjoying it very much. Um, I'm I'm very eclectic in what I read. So yeah, um, yeah. I've just finished a a book on uh, on Byron called um, Lord Byron Accounts Rendered. Uh, it's a book that I picked up from a friend. Um, it it's about um, all the all the accounting slips and account and basically financial documents that relate to to Byron um, mm -hmm. and what they show about who he really was. Um, uh, a lot of people have have um, have talked about Byron as being very difficult with money, um, and in fact he was incredibly generous. Um, and this book um, through through for the first time dealing with the actual documents of um, how the money was spent uh, shows this. Um, so, um, sorry, unrelated to uh, the, um, the present day, but- um, That's great, that's great. That is fantastic. And um, I know we, uh, Sishan Urgulu, one of our, our colleagues, a professor at the New School said, our entire class listened you know, to the Milo Rao talk and, uh, and people are listening um, to um, <clears throat> and, uh, the conversation. By the way, um, also Milo Rao just finished a Jesus film. You know, he took old Pasolini actors and from actors, no Gibson used oh. and because he felt they all got it wrong. And then Matera did a, a new film. So there seems to be something also um, in, up um, in the air. But um, what would you say to, uh, to, to our listeners, what to do, how to use that time and also to young artists like think about yourself in Botswana in these formative years where everything can happen, your career could have taken a completely different way. Um, is there something you, uh, you can, you would, you would not, you like, you would have known at that time. So if someone had told you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think that one, one really has to, um, to listen to your, to your inner voice. Um, and and uh, try to follow um, your true uh, desire. It's a it's a it's it's a hard thing to do because, um, for instance, I I spent two years at university trying to become a lawyer because that's what my uh, family wanted me to do, and no one believed in um, my um, my becoming a theatre person or an art person. Um, and and yet um, I kind of eventually did, um, and 
and thank goodness I did because I wouldn't have been a very good lawyer at all. Um, and so you, you've, got to, you've got to try to hear yourself. And um, I, we're, we're doing a bit of yoga at the moment. And at the end of the yoga, we have an, a wonderful relaxation moment when you can really um, just feel your, um, your body and your breath. Um, breath is always extremely important for all our, um, our work with puppetry because um, that is how you give life to an object through, through breath. Um, and it's that, um, that listening to, uh, to yourself um, uh, that I think is the most important thing to lead you into um, areas, uncharted areas that you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't, society wouldn't imagine for you. It's only from you that can those things can come. But quite often, uh, you know, with with the animal um, focus of our work, for instance, these things are only really um, apparent in retrospect. We we didn't plan to make animal centered puppetry. But looking back over three productions, we were able to say, oh, um, actually, all three of those productions were focused on animals. Um, maybe that's what we're doing. So it's, um, I think um, it's, it's important to know who you are, but sometimes um, what happens, uh, you, you don't really know what motivates you. I, I spoke also about our, our move to, to Cape Town from Johannesburg. I think that there was an ostensible reason, um, but there were other subconscious reasons for that, that move. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to sometimes to know what, what um, consciously what you should do. Um, but I, I think if you're listening, um, if you have a, um, uh, an ear for your inner ear, um, that's, that's always gonna help in terms of what you do um, going forward. Yes, thank you. Really, really, thank you so much for sharing. And surprising to hear from uh, South Africa that things somehow seem to be in some way working out a country that went through tremendous change and in, in a way symbolically says, if it's possible there, it should be possible um, for the world. And theater has played a role in, in your, your great contribution and the discoveries you made because of the place you were in, the kind of locally mm. working, but globally thinking the dramaturgy of it and the puppets who in a way you're like the early robots you know what you say the people are now discovering new things but it's a very old um old uh, craft going back as you also mentioned at the steel to the kleist and the marionette theater the old ideas so there was fascinating and hopefully we will hear more from south africa maybe we go back to the company that is producing the corona puppetry work in the house and um Thank you so, so much. And again, thanks also to our listeners for taking the time. I know it's a very busy time, strangely enough, uh, many calls and mails and things. We keep ourselves busy. Lucia Calamari said, the playwright from Italy, see, all day she's just moving objects and has a hard time writing, maybe two or three hours she can do her work. And uh, so listening to us um, is important. We need great theater, yeah. great performances. We need great audiences. And in a way, the same way as artists work through things and change things. Of course, it's important for you um, to, to, to take that up and, and uh, apply it for your own life and for the communities you are in. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow we will hear uh, from France, Austin Nozicielle and uh, Karen uh, Anne will talk to us from Rennes. They have in France, they have an idea of how to deal with what they do at the moment. They have the great Guillermo Calderon who comes from Chile, who also as a young Dawson was on the brisk of seeing the big change that happened there and does a very political theater, but also very significant theater as a writer and uh, a director next year. Next week, we will have the great Rimini Protocol from Germany. Peter Sellers uh, will be with us, Guy Regie Jr. from Haiti, uh, Jalila Bakar um, from, um, uh, from Tunisia. And uh, so I think it will be, uh, again, a kaleidoscope of, of, of puzzle pieces. We, try to put together in our mind to form something that actually is unknown. We all don't know what will happen and uh, we ask questions and hopefully better questions that come out of it. Again, thank you so much and uh, you and uh, Michael and for sharing your, your work. It means a lot to all of us and I hope you will all come. And I still haven't seen 
Übü in the Truth Commission. That's one of my great regrets. I heard once it was done in Los Angeles, and but I heard it too late. And I could, would have flown there to see it. Um, so I hope um, our path will meet again. And to all our listeners, um, thank you um, so very much. Again, also next week, Oscar Eustace from the Great Public Theater uh, will be part of this series and talking to Tony Torn, who runs a 20 person theater, 30 person in his tiny home, uh, uh, which he inherited from his father. So, uh, so we have two theater makers to hear also a bit about it. Is, what's going on in the New York theater scene. So thank you again. Thanks for HowlRound, Thea, VJ, and the Siegel team, May, Sun Young, and a great Jackie. So thank you all and good luck, Basil. And uh, we really, I wholly hope to see your work and see you again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.